All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. I've got a special guest with me today. I'm very excited about this conversation. I've been following Kim for, I don't know, half a year at least. Um, found her on TikTok. Love her content, love where, she, where she's coming from, which is bringing to the table. Um, so I want to introduce you to Kim. Kim, welcome to the show. Um, would you care to just let people know who you are in the world and what you do? Absolutely. Mike, thank you for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation today. For those of you who are having your first introduction to me, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Kim Bailey. I am born and raised in Houston, Texas. I am a child of the Black Baptist Church. And a huge part of my story is although I realized that I liked women at the age of 12, I did not come out until I was 28. And that 16 year gap is full of every prayer to, to, to pray the gay away that any human being could imaginably pray. And I'm also an attorney by trade. I have my own law firm and part of my public online persona, I'm on a mission to make thy kingdom come that will be done for folks that God ain't make straight because so much life is lost by um, teaching queer people that they must dissect themselves from their sexuality in order to please God. And so I'm here to restore that life, to bring back life and life more abundantly because it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Nice. I love it. Very cool. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I have so many questions already, but listen, I want to start off with, Kim, would you tell us your story? Obviously, you kind of gave us a giant overview, but I'd love to just hear a little bit more of the details of, you know, what it was like to grow up in the world you were in, what that journey was like, how that ended up changing. I want to hear all of it, whatever you're willing to share. I'm going to give it to you, Mike, and I'm also going to give you permission because my wife loves to tell me that I can talk for like 17 minutes at a time. <laughs> so uh, so we're going to we're going to piecemeal this and just go from there. Great. In order to really understand my story, you kind of have to understand my family and my background. So my parents are, you know, Black Southern people. They are both from Mississippi. They, you know, are very, now I wouldn't say that they're very religious people, but growing up, it was church every Sunday. My sister and I went to private evangelical Christian schools. We were focused on the family kids. I had Brio Magazine, Clubhouse Magazine. Like I was, if this is right, this is wrong, I will follow God. I will flee from every appearance of sin, even in elementary school. That was, you know, most Bible verses memorized. Um, you know, when we had praise and worship at my very white Christian school, I was like, listen, I too listen to third day, but have you ever heard of Kirk Franklin, my dear <laughs> classmates? So, so that, that was my upbringing and I was proud of it. You know, I never had a, oh, I don't want to go to church or I don't want to do that. No, I wanted to be right with God. I wanted to go to church. My sister growing up, she was like, oh, I want to sleep in. And I'm like, I want to be holy. All right. <laughs> so I'm getting dressed. Although I don't want to wear this dress, I wish I could wear basketball clothes, but we're going to go to church. So here I am in sixth grade, and sixth grade was kind of a difficult transition for me because I left from private school, private evangelical Christian school, to public school. When I tell you that the first two weeks of school, I ate lunch in the bathroom because my fifth grade teacher told me that kids that go to public schools, they don't believe in God. And they also will likely become school shooters. Like I am, I am so, I am so serious. So I'm like avoiding my classmates because I'm thinking that the devil is everywhere. That is my upbringing. Okay. Wow. Uh, Tim LaHaye left behind. Maybe I was, I was not going to be left behind. I was not going to be left behind. I woke <laughs> up one time in childhood and I couldn't find my mom, dad, or sister. And there were freshly folded laundry on the dining room table. And, you know, left behind makes me think you know, your clothes are going to be neatly folded in your soul. And I'm like, how did I miss it? That's my background. Wow. So here I am in sixth grade and I'm playing basketball. I'm a basketball player. And I, I start to feel like. If I could identify this feeling in my body, I think this is a crush. I think this is attraction, but it was toward my then best friend at the time. And so, you know, I 
Focus on the family taught me what to do in these situations. You got to run every thought past God and past the Bible. I go get my Bible. I can't remember if it was my little salty Bible or my NIV adventure Bible. I think it was the NIV adventure that had the little silver gilded edges to it. (laughs) And I flipped to the back and I'm like, all right. So if I like girls, I think there's a homo, homo, homosexuality. Okay, cool. Flip. Okay. I think I'm okay. I go. I'm like, okay, is it is it like a lesbian? Is it thespian, lesbian, lesbian? I see nothing. And I'm like, well, would you look at this? And then I flip to like where it says gay. And then it's like Leviticus and Roman. I'm like, okay, well, now I'm going to hell. So I must flee from this sin. I must not indulge in this sin. I must continue on the straight and narrow because that is what a good follower of Christ does. And if I'm going to be anything in this world, if my identity is going to be anywhere in this world, it is going to be that I am a Christ follower. 12 years old to 28 years old, I dated men. My feelings for women did not go away. I would be upfront with the men that I dated. Hey, what's up, homie? Um, yeah, we, you and I can be together, but just, just so you know, like if you ever see me looking at a girl, it's probably, I'm thinking the same thing that you're thinking, but don't worry about it because I'm not going to stumble. I've never fallen into that trap before, but I want to be upfront with you that I do actually find women to be quite attractive. I was a Bible study leader in college. I was a ministry leader. That was my entire identity. And um, I would be very transparent about the fact that I liked women. That was the thorn in my side that God sent me to be humble because obviously I can't be perfect and I serve God so well in so many other ways. So I've got this sin issue. Okay, everybody, I, I, I can relate. I can relate to what you're going through because I have my own, my own sin issue. I sought, um, it certainly was not professional therapy. It was the Exodus Ministries. Um, I I sought their assistance in um, getting that thorn out of my side. And that was quite a confusing experience because I was like, y'all are all gay. (laughs) Like y'all are all still gay. (laughs) And no, I was not, you know, there was nothing that happened to me in my childhood to make me this way. And now y'all are kind of freaking me out. That's the first part of my story, Mike. I've been talking. I'm gonna yeah, stop right there. Right. Get some more, but that's that. That's my story. Uh, yeah, that's I right. love it. I've got a couple of questions. Wait, so how yes. old were you when you went to Exodus? Uh, 21. I okay. was a, 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 a junior and senior in, in college. Okay, and did you find them on your on your own? Did someone suggest them to you? How did you find? No, them? my uh, my my campus minister at the time. I confided in her that this was like, hey, listen, okay, I'm praying every day. All right. And it's, it's getting, it's getting worse. It is. I had a boyfriend in college, but we believed that kissing was sin. So we kissed like three times and then decided to just take physical interaction out of our relationship. Um, yeah. And so like, on the one hand, it's like, yay, I am not falling into sin. But on the other hand, I'm not even thinking about you, bro. Like (laughs) I'm not even thinking about you. So I, I, I told, I told my mentor and she, uh, referred me to, I believe it was called First Light Ministries out of St. Louis. And it was like a little subdivision of Exodus. And uh, that's how I got started there. Wow. How long were you in the program for or whatever? About six months. Was it like, did you live there? Was it once a week? Like, how did that work? It was, I had, I had a one-on-one mentor that I met with um, once a week. And then we had group sessions and I did the group session. So I did the one-on-one for about three months. And then I did the group sessions for about three months. And I, the group sessions were not helping at all because I was like, we are all gay. We're all praying. This is just making me like, this is the most gay people I've ever been around. You know what I mean? Like, I kind of like, what you doing after this? You know, like this is, I, I don't, nothing that they were saying was making sense. None, none of it was, I was just like, this is not making me less gay. This is causing confusion, but this is not making me any less gay whatsoever. Wow. Okay. And then 
the boy the the guys you dated mm -hmm. and you were upfront about them with them about how you felt with girls like they were all just fine with that did they have any questions were they concerned like what how did they respond no they were all completely fine they were they were all like yeah i appreciate your transparency wow yeah. okay yeah <laughs> nice yeah okay cool so interesting so you went through the the exodus ish ministry you decided after six months, this isn't for me. It's not working. It's not helpful. Correct. And then what happened from there? I decided these people can't help me pray the gay away. So it's back to me and my own faith. And um, that became my thing. I mean, when I look back at, at old journals, it's just like, oh, God, I come before you as humbly as I know how. God, to admit and to confess and to repent of the attraction that I felt today toward women in general, God. I know, I know that this is evil, God. I know that this is not your plan for me, God. God, make me over again, God. Lord, empty me. I want more of you, Jesus. Like every single God, like Paul, I'm not even gonna sing. Don't, don't let me get started with you this morning, Mike. I would just, I would just pray. And I came, I really did rationalize it as we all have struggles and we are all called to pick up our cross and we are called to die to ourselves. I had a Lecrae poster that I made myself. I used to do crafting. Um, he had a quote that was like, something, something, something like, yeah, we can all be born into sin, but we're called to be born again. And so I was, you know, baptizing myself in that sort of doctrine every single day that I must be born again. And on about my, I don't know, 10,000th rebirth, <laughs> yeah. I was like, this system is not working. It's not working. And we're going to have to revisit some of the underlying assumptions that, that we have here um, because this is, this is not working. It's not sustainable. And it got to a point, Mike, you know, closer, closer to when I came out at 28, where me being, I was in relationship with a man who did tell me at that point that he thought that I would leave him for a woman. And I, I thought to myself, okay, well, that sounds, that sounds kind um, of serious. And I had to, awesome. I had to, uh, yeah, I had to acknowledge the, the, the truth behind that fear of, I feel like I am living a lie mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. by being with men. This is not natural. This is not comfortable. This is not doing anything to subside these feelings that I thought I needed to discipline out or pray out or deny myself out of. This is not, this is not working. And I came to recognize that if I, if I continue down this path that I've been brainwashed into believing God wants for me, that is going to lead to turmoil. That is going to lead to a broken marriage. That is going to lead to, a, I, 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 there was a conflict in myself of this is not who I am. Talking about, you know, being a heterosexual woman and it cannot be God's will for my life for me to spend every morsel of energy that I have making myself something that I am not. This cannot be what God gave me all of this talent so that I could suppress it to maintain my struggle to not be who I am. I don't think that God is that backwards. So we got some investigation to do here. Nice. Love it. Yeah. Okay. So you, you came out at 28. What you're up, you're sharing some of your mental process, right? Like logically piecing through this. I want to know 28. It looks like that was like a, a meaningful year in your life. Yeah. Yep. What happened? What do you feel like was pertinent in leading up to that? Please, any details you want to share? I'm so curious. Absolutely. So I was 28. I turned 28 in 2017. And I want to rewind back to the fall of 2016 because there was a show on Fox and it was called Pitch. And the lead actor on that show was a woman named Kylie Bunbury, who I happened to find extremely attractive <laughs> just from the commercials alone. 
And, you know, she's like a female athlete and all of this. And I just like, I'm looking at the commercials and I'm like, this is amazing. I want this. But then I'm like, no, Kim, this is going to lead you to sin. Like, this is going to be a stumbling block. And so I, I didn't want, I mean, I, I eventually watched the show, <laughs> but it was to the point where I was like, I no, cannot watch this. Yeah. Um, I had a friend, um, I, there were several situations. So I had a friend who was an OBGYN. Um, and we also went to church together and she would tell me things like, you know, Kim, and she had been there for my breakups and my relationships with men. And she would say things like, you know, have you ever considered the possibility that you just are a lesbian? <laughs> so at this point, Mike, I'm, I'm upset because I thought I had done such a good job curating the devil out of my life. Wow. And in my mind, the devil is now speaking through the lips of one of my closest friends who I need to distance myself from. And in that distancing, I got a new OBGYN, okay? <laughs> So I met the doctor and I'm telling her all of these issues about how when I eventually relent to having sexual interaction with my boyfriends, which, you know, I tried my hardest to just like, why don't we just, you know, save ourselves from marriage? You know, why don't, yeah, you know, anything to not have to do the do. And that OBGYN as well said, you know, based on what you have disclosed to me here. Have you ever considered the fact that maybe you just don't like men? Okay, now I got a problem. Why the, the gay agenda? Okay, Fox News was right. It's infiltrating every area of our lives, and I must continue to flee from sin. Oh my God! That was the fall of 2016. Mm -hmm. All right, now it's gonna get it's gonna get a little juicy, Mike. I gotta admit, I don't know a whole lot about your audience, but. I think from what I know from you, I think we're just going to go here. We're juicy is great. All right. Dating this guy. And um, I'm a lawyer. So I ended up going to a lawyer conference in San Francisco. He comes with me and, you know, I'm like, oh, I hope this guy does not try to have sex with me. I don't want to do that. Uh, uh, uh. So I, I have an idea. You know, I'm like, premarital sex is sin. Okay. If we're going to sin, Okay, why don't we just add a girl into the mix? All right, so let's consider having a threesome, right? If it, if I, if I, if I, if I, if, I, if, if we're, if we're gonna do it, just do it. Okay, get it out the way. Going big. Going big. So <laughs> I'm, I'm in San Francisco. I'm on apps like swiping, swiping, swiping. Okay, no, no threesome occurs. So we get back to Houston, and old dude is still kind of excited at the prospect. And, you know, get back on the apps. And this is my first time being like on a dating app and looking at women who have interests in women. And then I decided to be like, you know what? I've been thinking about this threesome. And I feel like it should be a twosome without you. <laughs> That is, that is, that is, that's where I'm, that's where I'm leaning right now. Um, and so what was that? This is amazing. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, shortly thereafter, I decided, you know, I obviously don't want to be with you. <laughs> um, and now it's May of 2017 and I am God. I'm here. I promise you, God. I don't want to sin, okay? I don't want evil. I don't want to do wrong. But what I've been told is right is not right for me. Kim, had you been going to church this whole time? Oh, absolutely. Uh, that, that, oh, that, that, the church story is going, that is absolutely a very relevant part to this story that comes a few months later. So you're still like leading Bible studies and things? No, 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 no. no. Oh, okay. So I, I stopped doing that when I okay. was in law school. Um, so I'm just, I'm just going to, okay. to just going to church. Got it. Know? Yeah. So, um, I'm having this conversation with myself where I'm like, I, I can't do it. I, I don't want to date men. I'm tired of this. This feels ridiculous. It doesn't feel natural. It doesn't feel right. So God, here's what we're going to do. Okay. Me and you, we're going to shut out the world. We're going to go figure this out. I'm going to get on this dating app. 
and I'm going to tell the world that I want to go on a date with a woman. And then I'm going to go on a date with a woman, God. And we are going to figure this out because if I'm going to, if it's evil, okay, like just let me make that decision for myself at this point. (laughs) Because the people who made the decision that heterosexuality was right for me, well, they lied. (laughs) <laughs> they were wrong and they were mistaken. So I had to take this into my own hands. <laughs> and my actual plan, like I kid you not, I was going to be gay or what have you from May to the end of July. And then on August 1st, I was going to push all I got. God, I experienced it. You are right. This is evil. I'm leaving it alone. August 1st, I'm coming back to you, God. That was the plan. I'm on the apps. I'm going on dates. Uh, People are like, what are your intentions? And I'm like, hey, check it out. So I love God. Um, I'm really just going through something right now. Uh, So my intention is to enjoy this summer, but um, no long-term anything because on on August 1st, I am returning on my heterosexual mission to populate the earth with uh, little miniature me's after marriage in a white picket fence. So uh, that's what I will be doing. Okay. Were you afraid that people were going to find out in your life that you were? Oh, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't care. I so that I I I got on the apps in May. I told my parents and my family in June because it's like this is who I am. It was this is who I am, y'all. And I I can't. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not. I'm not ashamed. Do I think I'm going to hell? Yes. Do I think that God's going to forgive me somewhere along the line and I'm going to? figure it out and repent and change my ways. Also, yes. Wow. But right now I have to figure this out right now. This is the case. And right now this is what I'm going to do. Okay. And and we can all figure out how to deal with that. And how did your family feel about you dating women for three months? Oh, no, 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 (laughs) no, 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 absolutely not. So picture this. It is Father's Day, 2017. All right. Here's here's the additional context. My poor sister, and I love my sister. She she was my biggest advocate in all of that, in all of this. My sister, who had had her first child outside of marriage, which was like the biggest scandal my family had ever experienced. <laughs> I mean, like the biggest scandal. How could you do this and you know better than the Bible is getting everything. So then my parents forced her to marry this man. Oh. Um, and she did. And because you cannot force someone to marry someone just because they had a child together, that marriage did not last. And my sister initiated a divorce, which then became the biggest second scandal in our family's history. So my sister was like the, the pinnacle of sin at this point in the family. And I came to her first and I was like, I got good news. Maybe it's bad news, I don't know. The good news is they're not gonna be worried about you for a little while, okay? Uh, Cause I like girls and I'm going to explore that. When I told my mother, um, mother, I have an announcement to make, that's what I said. And they said, please don't tell me you're pregnant. And I said, oh, no, 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 that is, that's not it. I was having a rocky relationship with my job at the time. And they said, did you get fired? And I said, oh, not yet. (laughs) That's not, that's not what's going on. They said, well, baby, what is it? I said, mom, dad, I like women. They stopped in their tracks. My mom's like, Okay, well, I like my girlfriends too. Like, what do you mean? And I was like, no, I'm gay. I like girls. I might have said I'm bisexual because I didn't know that I fully didn't like men at that point. But I was like, I, I like, I like girls. Um, and it's it's in a gay way. Um, my father had the biggest look of disgust and unbelief on his face. He walked out of the kitchen and never actually said a word to me on the subject for um, about a year. Now, when I say he didn't say a word, he typed many words. I have so many letters from my father with so many scriptural references um, about, you know, my just reprobate decision to live in sin (laughs) and to please my flesh and to be a servant of the devil. 
Wow. And my mom, on the other hand, was just, she was just completely confused and in shock and no, you're not. And you haven't re- met the right man. And I'm like, there is no right man. Um, <laughs> okay. That, that's what the situation is. So that was, uh, it was not good. It was not good. And it was not good for quite some time. I had to do what I had to do. Mom and daddy, y'all are going to be mad, but I would rather be mad. Y'all be mad at me and me actually be like physically okay. Then y'all be pleased with me and I'm dying on the inside every day. So be mad. I'm going to be gay. God still exists. And let's move on. Mike, here's where the problem happened. I got myself my first little girlfriend in July, two weeks before the deadline. (laughs) So I'm like, ah, girlfriend, here's the deal. Uh, August 1st is coming up. And she's like, what? She was a preacher's kid. And she was like, oh, not this again. Not not the whole like God the plan that I need to flee from sin, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. So you know God too, and you don't believe that. Okay, all right. Well, now I'm God. I need a 30-day extension. Okay. We've got some, we have some extenuating circumstances <laughs> that have arisen, and we've got to figure it out. Here's where church comes into play. Now, Mike, where are you from? I'm from Portland, Oregon area. Okay. All right. So I'm from Houston. I was living in Houston at the time. Um, At the time, I was going to a very popular um, mega church in Houston. It's called Hope City. I don't know if you've heard of it or uh, uh, a pastor named Jeremy Foster, who was very unfortunately back in the news very recently. Oh, no. Um, So I'm, I'm, I'm at this church. It's your standard multicultural church with a white pastor and a and rock band for worship. We met at a high school. They had the lights all turned down. Everybody's wearing H&M and hats and all of that, like that kind of place, right? <laughs> and it was the Sunday after the Charlottesville riot in 2017. Okay. Again, we've got this white pastor um, who has found himself to be very comfortable talking to his Black congregational members over the years. Um, a little too comfortable at times, um, but, you know, we just, we let so many things slide in the name of Jesus. I met church that Sunday um, still, and this is a church that was very clear, like marriage is between one man and one woman, like they were conservative. Despite the attire, it was conservative evangelical Christianity. And he's trying to address the nation's race debates. And part of my experience also as just being a black woman, I majored in political science and my double major was in African and African-American studies. And I'm pretty well grounded in in African-American history in this this country. Um, You know, I was at critical race theory um, symposiums and conferences before any Republican had ever heard of the term. So I had, you know, that sort of, grounding in my education about race and the pastor gets up that Sunday talks about race and the problems in this country and then he said now black people because he used to talk like he like he talked like he was our best friend okay black people listen y'all can't act like racial reconciliation in this country is just the job of white people y'all have work to do too and crossing this bridge And as a matter of fact, I want everyone in the congregation right now, I want you to stand up and I want you to find someone of a different ethnicity than you. And I want you to give them a hug and tell them I love you. And I'm thinking, what in the whitewashed American history kumbaya bullshit is this? I listened to that man preach about how homosexuality is a sin. I listened to that man preach about how it's a miracle of God that his abusive marriage had been restored and they love each other now. And I listened to that man talk about how weed is the devil's lettuce and it's a leading. I listened to that man say so many preposterous things that I did not challenge or question because this is a Bible believing man. He's a man of God. And I am not going to let my personal beliefs interfere with what God's word is. 
But when he said that about race, you know, just really a really small comment that I think exposed what his actual worldview was, I said, oh, no. Oh, oh, no. This, I'm, mm, I, mm, 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 I'm not hugging nobody. This is nonsense. There is a whole lot of work to be done. And I, you will not put the onus of this on Black people. Put on my little Black Baptist church finger, grab my Bible, my pen, and my journal. Because I used to be taking notes <laughs> during church. All right, y'all have a good, and I left. I walked out of church. And on my way home, I was just like, I, if this man, is going to present race issues in a way that I know not to be true. What else is it that he that I that he could be lying about, and what else is it that I could have been misunderstood about? And I remember going home, and I used to have like my entire um, you know library was like Chuck Swindoll or like Max Lucado or just these, quite frankly. White men who, in light of what Donald Trump was doing, were either encouraging him or staying silent on these issues. That is who had shaped my entire theological perspective throughout my life. And so I took a minute and I said, wait a minute. It's time for me to start asking some questions. When when the Jesus that I have always served and understood is a, is a Jesus of justice, a Jesus that would say, how can we reconcile that which has always been broken? You know, if to reconcile, we're coming back to something. What is there to come back to? And when I started looking at issues of race issues through the lens of the gospel and seeing the vast disconnect between what I believed and what the people who have been leading me believe, I said, there's, there's got to be more. There's got to be more. And so that was like, the crack that opened the door for me to, to rethink, reconsider, and get to know God on my own without this very conservative lens that I had been taught to view God through. And I had been taught that viewing God through this narrow lens was an honorable, the right, and the only way to perceive of God, of Christianity, of the Bible, and of relationship with love and justice. That's how I got, I started, I guess my deconstruction journey was I may not know what to do about this gay stuff. And I may not, I may not be able to figure out, is this sin? Is this not sin? But I know that right there that I saw and that was some kind of sin right there. Fun part of the story. Um, Jeremy Foster actually ended up getting kicked out of that church for having a year long affair with somebody on his staff. After he got caught, he divorced his wife, then married his mistress three months later, has been silent on social media for like a year and a half, and then just came back two weeks ago and was just like, yeah, I made a mistake, but God's healed me. Me and my new wife are great, and give me a church to leave. So, yeah, that's that. Okay, so this was this was you at 28. That was me at 28. So yep. that was like a big fissure in the foundation of what you had understood and accepted as like this big support and background that, you know, was grounding your worldview and beliefs. So now you're like, okay, something's deeply wrong, which, you know, very relatable. And then you say you came out at 28, right? Mm -hmm. What happened when you're like, I don't know what to do with the gay stuff. That mm -hmm. was a problem, right? Mm -hmm. How did you get mm -hmm. from that to, okay, I'm a lesbian. I'm going to, you know, what, what, what happened there? So also during that same summer, my little three week hot, uh, three month hot girl summer, I'm picking up these books, right? I'm, I'm reaching out to my friends in seminary. I'm reaching out to my spiritual advisors and I'm confiding in them. Y'all, y'all been new that I like girls. Okay. Well now I'm, I am, I'm dating girls and I am looking back over the scripture and I'm not. I'm I'm just not sure that this means that this is a sin. You know, can you can you help me understand? And I never got a response that made sense. Um, and so for me, I decided, you know what? After this hot girl summer, I'm just going to be celibate. I'm not going to marry a man because that would be a lie. And I'm not going to live my life as a lie. But I'm also not going to be with a woman because that is sin. And as I sat and thought of what my life would look like, I like I I'm a Pisces. My 
I've been, I started writing love songs in freaking third grade. My best friend who I had a very clear crush on, I would like text her poems every morning on the way to school, just so that she would have a good day. Okay. Like I, I, I am a sap. I love love. I love relationships. Um, and I, I thought to myself, why would God withhold that from me? Why? What glory does God get from my suffering on this earth? You mean to tell me that I can't have an intimate relationship at all because I don't want an intimate relationship with a man? And it, it, it was, there's so much energy that is required to suppress that. And there's so much energy that's required to deny that. I said, I have good things to offer God. I have good things to offer the body of Christ, but I cannot offer those things if all of my energy goes into suppression and repression. God, this makes no sense. And God, I trust you. I don't think that you are ridiculous. I believe in a God that gives good gifts. And this is not good gifts. This is a trap. God, we've spent 16 years together, praying, denying. God, I've asked you to remove every other spirit from my body, my anger. I used to, Mike, I'm, I'm an athlete, I'm a basketball player. But when I get on the court, I get a little cocky. I'll be cussing people out. <laughs> and I, for real, like I stopped playing basketball for a while because I was like my carnal man just rises up within me on the basketball court, Lord, do not let me return to my place of sin until I have my anger issues under control and can honor you even on the court. Like I was willing to give everything to God and the things that I gave to God that God did not want to be part of me, God took away. And I'm like, you, God, you're not a failure, but I'm still gay. <laughs> I am still gay. I, I have prayed. I have fasted. I am doing everything that I can, God. But for what? Is this a sacrifice that you even want? And let me tell you what opened my perspective to look at the Bible differently. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, with Unfit Christian in the work of Danielle Thomas, but um, she's got a, a pretty... A pretty um, large platform these days. Back in 2016, 2017, she was blogging about just, you know, her journey, her deconstruction and things of the sort. And there was a Facebook group called the Unfit Christian Congregation. I found the Unfit Christian Congregation because someone that I had went to church with, my evangelical conservative evangelical church, posted an article that said, sis, your Boaz isn't coming and neither are you if you keep waiting on him. <laughs> and that's like the wild, like the wildest title I had ever seen in my life. I love that. And I saw it posted by someone who I knew to be, he had seminary experience. You know, he made good decisions. He was a leader in the church and I started reading it and I'm like, why would he post this? This is and then she got in talking about, um, you know, how Ruth laid herself at Boaz's feet and the different things that feet mean in scripture. And it was just, I said, I've never, I've never, no one has ever told me these things before. This is the most radical reading of this scripture I've ever read. This changes the whole story for me. And then there were citations. I'm, you know, I'm a scholar. We got academic citations. And I'm like, you mean to tell me she's not just making this up to be comfortable with her sin and that this story of Ruth and Boaz is not the same story that's been fed to me in church? And Mike, let me tell you what y'all should have never let me do. <laughs> y'all should have never let me read Genesis 19 and Sodom and Gomorrah. Because part of the, the one of the most confusing parts, if you will, about my journey is although I am a Bible study leader, I'm a ministry leader, I'm a scripture leader, I'm going to these leadership scriptural evangelical conferences and X, Y, and Z, I would read 
highlight, annotate. I use Strong's. I didn't know any better back then. <laughs> I would I, I would do all of that to every scripture, but I never, I never looked at the scriptures that said that that implied that it was a sin to be gay, other than Leviticus. And then I knew the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and I knew that there were a couple of things in the New Testament, but I didn't read them. I didn't study them. I didn't challenge them. I just accepted them as foregone conclusions. Mm. And so then I said, I want to get into, I, I read, you know, a few like sexual sexuality in the black church by Kelly Brown Douglas. And I'm like, okay, this helps, but this doesn't point to any scripture that says that it's okay to be gay. Let me just read this myself. And I went to Sodom and Gomorrah and I said, oh my God, my entire life, I have believed that this text was about the destruction of a city because everyone was gay. And I'm like, bro, I'm flipping. Okay, maybe my NIV lied. Hey, anybody got an ESV I can read real quick? Hey, oh, okay, what did the King James Version say? And I'm, I'm looking for it. I'm looking for all of the horrible homosexuality. And I'm like, I see massive sexual assault and why is this man offering his prepubescent children to a group of strangers <laughs> but i see no homosexuality and they're they're, they're gay. everybody's gay what and the whole city is gay <laughs> and we know that because one person said bring out those strangers and let me have my way with them that's not gay that's sexual assault if they're gay why are they not gay with each other <laughs> what is that, Mike? If it's every man in the city was right there and wasn't no gay sex happening, y'all should have never let me read Genesis 19. I promise you. Yeah, should have never done it. Yeah, should have never done it. You should have just said that's what it says and that's what it means and that's what it is. <laughs> no, that 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 opened everything upside down, front side backwards. I said, oh my God, I cannot believe that I never questioned any of this before. And I've been living my life on someone else's rendition of the truth, which is obviously a bastardization of the truth. And why can't we actually talk about the horrific actions that are happening here in the text? But like when your focus is gay is evil, gay is it. You miss literal sex crimes time and time again, time and time again. So that was my, all these people are crazy. I got to unlearn everything that I have learned, unlearn it all, but I still want God. I don't like, I'm still, I, I still love God. I'm not over here. My first time I ever had sexual relations with a woman. Okay. I, I prayed beforehand. I was just like, God, please, like, do not take me out today. I, I was like deathly afraid that both of us were going to get struck by lightning <laughs> inside her apartment. Like I drove home and I'm like, I'm about to get into a car accident because God is going to punish me for this sin. I made it home safely. And I'm like, somebody's about to follow me in my apartment and like, take me out because God doesn't like God hates sin. And then I woke up the next day and there was peace in my spirit, Mike. And I was confused by it. I said, is this, am I, am I, is this a reprobate mind? Like I, I physically and emotionally and spiritually felt good after doing what I've been told is like the most grievous sin of all. And so I'm like, oh my God, I must, I must be, I must be a reprobate. And I, I started going through scenarios in my head and I'm like, okay, do I think that murder is bad? Okay, yes, I still think that murder is bad. Okay, do I think that it's okay to steal from people? Okay, no, I don't think it's okay to steal people. Like, and do I want to cuss my grandma out right now? <laughs> like, no, okay, I don't want to do evil things. <laughs> and so I'm like, but the scripture said that I'm gonna be a reprobate. But my sense of right and wrong has not changed at all. And I'm, I'm sitting on my couch and I'm like, God, like, you know, Adam and Eve, like, oh, where are the, God, <laughs> you, you, you still here? <laughs> I hear a still small voice being like, yeah. And I'm like, oh my gosh, is that God or is it the devil? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Would the devil be answering me? Would this God even want to talk to me right now? And then I'm like, God, okay. If what I did was sin last night, <sighs> Give me a sign. 
And I'm just sitting there with peace in my spirit. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is a trick of the enemy. No, no, this has to be wrong. And then I was like, Kim, snap the hell out of it. Snap out of it. Snap out of it. You are okay. You're alive. God is here. You still have a song in your heart. You still want to pray. Like you still know right from wrong. You are not trash. You are not evil. You feel alive. Ask yourself, why is it that I finally feel alive for the first time? Why? Is this what sin feels like? I had to read a book in college called The Smell of Sin. And I'm like, I'm not experiencing any smell of sin. What's going on? That's what happened. (laughs) That was art. Thank you for sharing. That was, I haven't laughed. I don't think I've ever laughed this hard in an interview before. This is hilarious. Um, Wow. Okay. And were you still dating that girl that you got the extension for while this was happening? I, yes, 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 I was. Yes, I was. And then that relationship crashed and burned, um, you know, a few months later. And one of the things that really scared me was my mom. I love my mom. My mom is affirming now, but she was absolutely not affirming then. Um, and she told me that no relationship that I was in would ever succeed because God won't bless sin. And so when that first relationship with a woman crashed and burned, I was like, is this God's judgment on my life? You know, is this, is this because we were living in sin? And then, you know, I talked to a few rational friends and they're like, no, don't move on. And I'm like, oh, okay. All right. So um, maybe I can have a successful relationship. And I don't have to believe that all of my relationships will will crash and burn. And I learned what I needed to learn from that relationship. And I'm I'm going to continue. So yeah, that was, you know, from my extension in August till about October, I think is when um, I started, you know, actually getting into the text and then meeting, meeting other queer Christians. Because here's the thing, Mike, when I came out, I didn't know no queer people. I didn't know no lesbians. I didn't know no gay people. I didn't know any trans people because in my previous life, I had to flee from sin. I cannot be friends with people who are living a way that I am trying to flee from. So once I finally met other queer people, and they were like, oh, yeah, I love God. And I was like, what? What? Like, we can do that for real? We can do that. We, we can. Um, so that that just that, that opened my world to like, wait, hold on. So how long have you been queer and loving? Five years. You ain't, your house didn't set on fire. <laughs> I'm like, you ain't getting to no like tragic car accident for inexplicable circumstances that was <laughs> God just showing you that God is supreme and that sin will never... When you are a normal, well-adjusted person, you're married, you have kids, and you and you love God. Oh, okay. Well, you know, Fox News and crew told me that that was impossible, that we all hate God, and that we all love sin. We all love Satan. And you mean that they were lying too? <laughs> okay. All right. Satan, by the way, I don't love you. So uh, me and God are sticking together. And... God, is that still you? Oh, yeah, that, that's still you. Okay, let's go. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wait, so then when you walked out of Hope City uh, yeah. that time, did you go back after that? And were you there for a while? Like, and no, then, I did not. Oh, was that your last time there? That was my last time there. Wow. That was my you. last time there. And wow. that was my last like experience with formal church. Wow. Attendance and membership. So. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So when you're meeting all these queer Christians who are living these whole lives and aren't being burned up or, you know, randomly killed, what happened with your faith journey in the midst of that awakening? Like, yeah, what, how did, if you weren't going to church anymore, what did that look like? Oh, I was, I was, I was absolutely on fire for God. 
I was like, to me, it was a, I want to read every, every single academic text that I can get my hands on to understand other perspectives about God. So I had, I had never heard of liberation theology, James Cone. I had never heard of queer theology. I had Our Lives Matter by Pamela Lightsey. Like I, I reached out to um, uh, a minister um, who was, you know, she had taught at seminary, she'd been in seminary and she gave me a syllabus. And we worked one-on-one through those texts together wow. to help me understand more truths about God and more history about the Bible from like an academic rigorous perspective. So I went into more of like a, an academic um, Bible and an academic God setting with that information. Mm. And there was a while where, you know, we start to talk about race for a second. I wanted to find an affirming church, but in Houston, I couldn't find any affirming churches with black people. And I had previously had some, some pretty, you know, unpleasant experiences being the only black person in a white church. And so I'm like, well, I want somewhere where I can be affirmed for being gay, but do you also support black people? <laughs> and then I would go to, I would, you know, think about, I would maybe tune in online to somewhere. And again, my, I'll tell you this, Mike, my very first girlfriend, and I'm so grateful for her for saying this and for helping me and for showing me my very first girlfriend said to me one day, you know, Kim, you're basically like a white man. And that was a true statement. It was a true statement. I had been brought up in so many conservative circles and my, my worldview was so narrow and it was so limited. And so also when I'm looking for an affirming church, again, I'm a, I'm a Baptist. Baptist black church girl. <laughs> and I would find something like a, you know, Unitarian Universalist. And I was just like, they love everything. Like, do y'all believe in sin at all? You know, that <laughs> that's how I'm like, I'm not trying to go somewhere that says that everything is okay. Um, but I just want somewhere that says that like it's okay to be gay. And also black people deserve full rights and shouldn't have the police state enforced upon them and are not in the condition that they are in because they are individual moral failures, but because there's a thing called systemic racism. And I couldn't find a church in a physical church that, that espoused those type of beliefs. So I just found myself in online church spaces like the unfit Christian congregation. Um, I would go to like conferences or um, the Smithsonian would have an, uh, a, a speaker series on Black millennial faith and sexuality. And I would just come hear different pastors and seminarians and scholars talk about faith from an academic perspective and root their justice work in the Bible. So that became, that that was my circle. And then with the community of people that I was building, my, you're not going to be in my house without hearing some glory to glory to glory to glory. Like I'm, I'm like worship is what I do. This tattoo on my arm says, God, your name is the sound of my breathing. I speak your name every time I breathe. That's a Donald Lawrence song. So the worship was in my bones. The church was in my community. And the leadership was by listening to people like you online and hearing, okay, this is actually a well thought out. Because when I first came out and I'm Googling like, is it okay to be gay, <laughs> right? And, and again, 2017, it's just like, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. And I'm like, okay, but that's cool. That's cool. But that's not, that's not clearing the burden of proof mm. for me. And then I would see things that be like, well, the Bible, you know, it technically, it never contemplates a loving and affirming same-sex relationship. And I'm like, that's cool, but I'm on Tinder. So that's not really, that's not really helping me understand what's going on here. And so I, I, I didn't get the answers given to me the way that answers and instruction and direction had been given to me previously. 
And so I said, I, I have to figure this out for myself. And I'm going everywhere in the world and having every conversation with whoever I need to talk to to figure this out for myself. And hopefully by the time I figure this out for myself, then I can finally find an affirming church that I can call home. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That answers that question. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. So it sounds like from my perspective, you've done work that I think a lot of queer people coming out of the church I think probably don't even consider because it just seems like it's too daunting. Like there's too much to have to get into or like work through or whatever, but you like went through it and pulled it apart and sought the places and the people and the resources to like get yourself there. And it wasn't any one resource, right? right? That's very similar to my process too. I had to like go and find and hunt and, you know, um, yeah. what? Yeah. And what? then, so then, okay. I was going to continue the conversation. You yeah, ready? yeah, go. Yeah, that's great. All right. So then I'm like, I, I end up meeting my wife in <laughs> fun story. After I broke up with that girl, um, <laughs> I went on like, just like a dating spree. Somebody was just like, Kim, you're a catch, act like it. And I was like, yeah, I like it. One of my little dating spree and I was like, oh, that, that's too much. It's too much casual. I don't, I don't know how to do this. I want to get married X, Y, and Z. Mm. The woman that I met before I met my wife, um, we had a, a beautiful short-lived found me, she found me on Instagram, you know, long distance. Let's just, oh, as it turns out, you're more like in love with like who you think I am than like who I actually am. But here's the thing, Mike, this was a real challenge because again, I love God. And when, when I love anything in the world, I'm going to talk about it, talk about it loudly to everyone that I know. <laughs> and, and, and so, and so she was not raised religiously at all and she thought that christianity religion god all of that was nonsense so i'm expanding my faith to the point where i i i respect people who have that opinion you get to have that opinion i don't think it's the end of the world for somebody to have it's not how i feel but you get to have that opinion whatever do you still love me can we still be in a relationship and I remember after one of our visits together, she said, hey, two things. You listen to a lot of gospel music. <laughs> and I don't want to hear that in my house. And she said, you talk about God a lot. And I don't want to hear that either. <laughs> and, and, and this was someone who like I thought was like my dream woman at the time. And so now it's like, this is my my dream, my little gay dream relationship here. And I feel like I'm being forced to choose between that. And at first I was like, okay, well, like, you know, God is love. And so if I just said like love instead of God, would that make you feel more comfortable? And she was like, yeah. And then I was like, but I don't actually want to do that. I don't actually want to do that because I, I, I literally love God, okay? And I love the same God that my grandmother loves even though she doesn't understand how it's okay to be gay. Mm. We pray to the same God. And these are the same God that, this, that helped my ancestors survive slavery in this country. Like it, it's in my blood. It's in my blood. I believe in God. Okay. And I want my hymns to affirm my belief in God. And so when I, when I met my wife, I was like, yo, listen, if gospel music is not your thing, you, we're going to have to bounce right now, okay? Because it's I, all day I'm going to wake up singing, I'm going to go to bed singing, like I'm going to pray. I'm not going to kneel on my knees and put my hands over you and say, well, God, we got to pray. But like, girl, I think you are fine. I think you are amazing. I think you are beautiful. I thank God for you. And I also want to pray over your day because I want you to have a good one. I want your mind to be at peace. I want your body to be at peace. I want you to be whole. I want you to be healthy. And like, you got to be okay with these things. <laughs> and she was. So we got married. And I'm, this, this, there's, a, there's so much story. My of course, yeah. And everything. Yeah. But I want to talk about kind of like the beginning of my, my public platform on yeah. this, if you will. My wife and I got married in July of 2020. And shortly thereafter, I am just basking in the goodness of this beautiful life that God has allowed me to have 
And I'm so grateful that I no longer believe the lie that, that, that God wanted me to exercise myself from myself to give God glory. Cause if that was the case, I would still be in a closet suffering somewhere. And like, who benefits from that? What, why, what, why would I want to serve a God who would be like, I'm going to put this in you, but if you do anything about it, I'm going to send you to hell. I was <laughs> my beliefs about hell. I was like, this is just, there's a lot, a lot of craziness going on. But my, I posted on Instagram one day that I was so grateful to God for bringing my beautiful wife into my life and for giving me this beautiful life. And someone who I had previously been a ministry leader with sent me a DM and was like, how dare you use God, like be grateful to God for your marriage, which is clearly not in God's will. And that upset me. Because number one, when I speak positively about my wife, you're either going to clap your hands or you're going to shut the hell up. Okay, <laughs> those are your options. <laughs> like, don't, I, I'm talking about my wife now. Like, don't want to watch, watch the words you put in your mouth. And number two, I'm tired of this lie. Mm. I'm tired of, of the church telling queer people that they cannot have God. What, what are you, what are you people doing? Why are you doing this? Why are you so hell bent in telling us that whoever we think we're in relationship with, it is not the God of love. It is not the God that we know. It is some crooked, horrible figure that has twisted our entire life. I was like, mm. stop the lies. And I got on the internet and I just, I just spoke. I spoke my story. I spoke my testimony. I spoke my questions. I spoke my heartache because I was mad. I was mad, girl, you're not finna sit up here and speak death over my relationship and speak lies over God as if they are truth. You're not going to do that. Mm. Because people did that to me entirely too long and there was so much life lost. And I'm grateful that I was able to survive. But so many people don't survive. Right. They don't survive at all. They don't survive. They, they literally die. And so I spoke and... I don't, I didn't, I did not have a lot of followers back then. You know, I had a, a few thousand. Mike, I got hundreds of messages in my inbox of this is my story. This is my song. This is my struggle. I've never heard it put this way. I thought that I couldn't have God if I were gay. And so I turned away from God, but I still want that relationship, but I don't know how. I don't want to go to church. I'm afraid to open my Bible. I'm afraid to look. And I had been through all of that. I had been through all of that. And I was like, well, you know, do, do you want to know how I did it? And that's how, that's how all of this got started was we all have this struggle. We don't want, we're, we're told that you can either be gay or have God, but you cannot have both. And you talk about a lie from the pit of hell, and that is one of the biggest ones that we have. And so my ministry, if you will, was built out of, we don't have to choose. Like when, when we believe that God is not like man, we believe that God is not like man because this is actually dumb. <laughs> it's, it's illogical. Not to mention the different lies that we have to tell ourselves about what the Bible is and what this says in order to live a life that is not free. It's not free. You talk about queer people, they make they make a, a the that is the make a lie out of the truth or whatever. And I'm like, no, y'all, the it's the other way around. Um, and so I'm I'm you know, I got a lot to say. I got a lot to say. And that's how we got started. Nice. I love it. I'm so glad you say it. So when you use the word ministry, which I'm intrigued by what, so you're on TikTok, you're on Instagram, you see a ministerial type function to what you're putting out there. Can you speak to like, what do you, how do people engage with you? What's, what's available? How are in, in what ways are able people able to receive from what you're doing? Like, can you tell us about that? Yes. And so, so this is a, this is an ever changing question, if you okay. will, because now I'm balancing in the, in the midst of all of this, in the midst of those conversations, I also quit my full-time job at a law firm in July of 2021. 
And so I have my own law firm now, which I wanted for a variety. Well, I kind of didn't want it, but I just didn't want to work with them anymore. Um, but I needed space to like figure this out, space to be online whenever I wanted to, you know, space to have these conversations. And I'm still working to create that space. But what happened after that first set of conversations in August or so of 2020 is people started asking for more. I didn't have a plan. I was like, no, I just, this is my story. This is how I did it. Like, <laughs> have a good day, you know? And people were like, no, but like, like I need help. And I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's make a few things clear. Okay. Just because I read books that you read in seminary does not mean that like, I have the fullest understanding of this. Um, you know, and they were like, we don't care. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we don't care. We just want to talk. Cool. So I made a group and that was called The Culture. Um, and it started off by just, it started off by me saying, hey, okay, you guys want to have this conversation. Can a few of you just raise your hands, just slide in my DMs. And if you want to have this conversation, like I'll work with you one-on-one, -on -one, but disclaimer, I am not a professional. Disclaimer, Everybody needs to be in therapy. <laughs> Disclaimer, like, we're going to figure this out together. But I worked, you know, just one-on-one -on -one meeting with people like, what is your story? You know, what is your fear? What is your hope? Where are you getting stuck? And I realized that those conversations were actually very, 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 very fruitful. And then at the end of those one-on-one -on -one conversations I had, people were like, well, how do I meet other people like this? And I was like, uh, you can just find them in my Instagram comment section. Uh, that's what you should do. <laughs> so I made, I made a group. I made a group, it's called The Culture. Um, and the purpose of the group was to be a place for queer, black, churched women to be in community with other queer black churched women. Mm. And I was like, churched is a past tense statement mm. because some of us don't ever want to go back. Mm. And I can understand that and I can respect that, but we still want God. And so we have God in this space. We are going to lift each other up in this space. We're going to ask each other questions in this space. And the space has taken you know, a variety of iterations. It started off just being like, okay, here's a Zoom, here's a link. Let's all meet up and hang out. Um, we had an app at one point. We are currently switching apps right now to be more community. So it's something that I actually don't talk about the actual internal culture group. There's about 50 of us in there right now. Um, and I'm trying to figure out like, okay, what is a mechanism that can make this sustainable um, so that we can have, you know, a container. But as of right now, that, that's in flux. So mm -hmm. I talk on the internet and people listen. Oh, here's the other thing. I had a retreat. I made a retreat in 2021. Yeah. I was like, y'all want to talk? Let's talk. And I had a retreat. And then there were like five or six women who came to Houston from all over the country. And we had the time of our lives. Wow. We told our stories. We worshiped together. And for so many of us, it was our first opportunity to be, to be gay, right? To, to not deny that. And also to be in a space that is affirmed, that is, that is loving God at the same time. Um, and that was a very powerful experience. My wife has her own community. She's a very powerful life coach. Um, and so, you know, we've just been able to create these spaces, um, kind of impromptu pop-up spaces mm. of come let's talk, let's love, let's worship. Where two or three are gathered really is where two or three are gathered. Even if we are not in a church house, y'all, we're, we we're here because we love each other. And we're here because we love the world. And we're here because we see an injustice being done and we want to right that wrong. And that is worship. That is holiness. That is community. Nice. So that's where we are with that. Wow. Okay. Really good to know. I didn't know that. That's amazing. I yes, love that. Yes. Yes. Because I, I, I'm trying to. I'm trying to figure it out and trying to like get <laughs> yeah. a. What is this going to be? How are we going to package this? That. That is 
still under construction to this day. It's great. Yeah. And you're going to figure it out. This is part of how you get there, right? That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. So how do people get a hold of you? How do they get access to just knowing where you are? What kind of pop-ups are available? What's the best way, best place for them to find that? The, the It's crazy because Instagram is the best place to find okay. it. Now, Mike, again, I'm working on it. All right. One day <laughs> we're going to have like a website. <laughs> and uh, one day we're going to have, you know, some announcements somewhere, uh, but that's still under flux right now. And so, you know, TikTok, I, I, I post on both platforms, but Instagram is like an actual community. You know what I mean? Like there, yeah. there's people there. We, we've been knowing each other for years. Um, and so that's where I say, you know, hey, y'all, uh, you know, in in May, for example, I'm partnering with Erica Mason, who is a Christian hip hop artist. And, or she was a, a Christian rapper, and then she came out as, as gay, um, and now she's just a phenomenal artist, but she also loves God, and so we're doing, you know, a music and healing and faith thing for queer people in May, and that's going to be in LA, so, um, you know, once I had the details about that, I'll, I'll post that, and that's open for everyone. Those sorts of things is, is what I'm engaging in right now. Cool. Love it. That's yeah. awesome. Okay, yeah. so for people to go to in your Instagram is like the best way to like that's your storefront basically at this point. There's or like yes. your doorstep, like yes. come there first. Yes. Great. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yep. Cool. And then we also the group for the culture. The group has an Instagram, oh, okay. um, and I am grateful because I I'm, I'm not the most responsive person in the DMs. Um, but the culture has an advisory board with six other beautiful and amazing queer women of faith. Um, and, and they are really good. The culture, okay, Mike, sorry. The culture does host events. We had a YouTube live that was two weeks ago. That was a phenomenal experience. We had over 300 people join us for that conversation. Wow. Um, and we'll be hosting other events. We had a dating event last year that went awesome. So yeah, we do, we do have events, but they are just, you know, they, the, the plan, planning is not my forte. So um, for the culture is the Instagram for dot the dot culture with a Q. Oh, and, um, yeah. And it's it's also the name of my debut rap song. Uh, so my you hadn't heard my song. No. OK. All right. This is what I'm this is what I'm going to do real quick. And I'm going to do this. Why am I going to do this? I don't know. OK, <laughs> but I'm going I'm going to speed talk verse two because that is that's the most that's 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 kind of the verse that hits let's go okay. so um verse two says the bass bumping jumping out of the gate i'm coming out with the gaze hey, yo montero go get lizzo i'm a get lean away this is a song for the day this is a song for the way this is a song that changed the meaning of my nigga that's gay how you gonna hate anyway it's so much more i can say stayed in the closet couldn't rock it till i turned 28 this is my time to create i'm on a mission to make that kingdom come that will be done for folks that god ain't make straight so i stay rocking my crown ain't no knocking my down Ain't no knocking me down. I got the breath of life in me. This is holy ground. I speak to angels with sound. This beat been calling them down. I know where strength is made perfect. I look up when I'm down. If I was lost and I'm found, this here is glorious rebound. I am from another planet. I just play on this ground. Told me shoot from the moon. At least you'll land with the stars. Now look, I overshot it. Now I'm speaking from Mars for the culture. So that was the whole thing. Yeah. Whoa, nice. Yeah. Thank I like you. to rap a little bit. Yeah, I don't think I'm Lil Wayne. Okay. <laughs> um, What's the name of the song? Uh, for the culture. Okay. I made a whole music video. It's on awesome. You it's got like a hundred views on YouTube, and I'm his <laughs> biggest fan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I'll have to check that out. I'm gonna put that in the show notes below as well. Check it out. That's check awesome. I check love that. Wow, Kim. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Have you done any stand up? You know, here's the deal, Mike. I've not. I've I've not. I've not. I've not. I'm okay. Well, for what it's worth, I feel like you probably have some. You have some talent there. Like people would. I mean, I was dying throughout this whole conversation, and we're just talking. Like, yeah. I mean, you have this like showmanship, you know, and like, <laughs> yeah, you might be. I mean, I don't know. You've got all this stuff on your plate, but that would be really entertaining. I, you know, I, I appreciate that. I did have the thought last night. I was like, hmm. What if I did like stand up stories on TikTok where I just tell stories and I'm standing up and it's like a stand up comedy type of stand up stories. So yes. I appreciate this affirmation I've received today. From I, you. I love that idea. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. We want it. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay, cool. Well, 
Kim, I've got have to land this plane, but thank you so much for coming on here and sharing your story. I everyone who's listening, go find Kim, go follow her. She's got great stuff, TikTok or Instagram, but Instagram is where the community is really happening. So yeah. you know, yeah. maybe check that out more. Um, Kim, thank you so much for being here and just also just thank you for the work that you're doing in the world, the spaces you're providing, the things you're articulating, the intelligence, the humor, the the attitude. I love it. I'm here for it. So we need it. So thank you for who you are and what you're doing in the world. Um, everyone go find Kim. I'm putting the links below so you can find her Instagram, the rap song. It's a great song, y'all. It's a great song. It's a great, I've got to tell you, it's a great, the, the music video is pure brilliance. So <laughs> nice. that's awesome. Okay, everyone. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. Thank you.